We will uh, reconvene. Technically, practically speaking, I would like to let you know that you have a simultaneous translation into English, French, and Spanish. Also, those who are connected on the Zoom, when you get in, you can choose your language. And 6.30 is the time we will try to finish because we have to free the room. And uh, thank you very much for being here. Welcome. I am Dante Maschio from Ingeniería Sin Fronteras, International Cooperation Organization, working on basic service fields. We understand technology as a tool that can guarantee human rights. We believe that water and energy are uh, human uh, rights. I'm also a member of I Was Vida, a citizenship platform here in Catalonia. We uh, want uh, public management of water, re-municipalization. We want public and democratic management of water. We want to include citizenship in the decision making. And we should also take into account the ecosystem limits when managing water. Today, I am here as a member of the European Movement for Water. This is a European network of different countries where we strive for the human right to water. And this network is the one to blame. And that's why we're all here. We've been two days here talking in an assembly fashion on how to continue all of us together. They will come now. And one of the topics that we tackled was how to participate in this Solidarity Alliance for this World uh, Water Forum that will be celebrated in March 2022 in Dakar. So they will soon join us. It is a good opportunity to meet activists of countries such as Portugal, France, Italy, Serbia, uh, Brussels, uh, Germany, among others. And uh, we can use the chat for the, and we will have a debate after the presentations. And as I said before, the objective of these conversations is to see how we can build together a uh, joint path towards the World Water Forum. This is a forum which is uh, uh, an alternative to the World Water Forum. It is for us the forum for companies, and we want to create this alternative forum. Uh, the uh, uh, a water forum is created by a large company, a lobby of the water uh, in the world, and uh, they believe that uh, well, this is the ninth uh, forum organized every three years. And this year, in March 2022, it will be organized in Dakar. And the slogan is uh, uh, water, security, and peace for the world. For us, uh, this slogan, we need to be very critical and we need to read it carefully because under this uh, slogan they want to privatize they want to build large infrastructures and large debts that involve uh, large multinational companies and financial companies such as in the year 2000 at the beginning of the millennium from the water movement we were reading the world water crisis in a critical way because the multinational companies were using the crisis to boost privatization movements and regularization of policies internationally. We believe that we need to read critically this water safety uh, because if we don't read this uh, critically, we will see large uh, private management infrastructures to have more inequalities uh, in water and more poverty along these lines. This is also used to have large investment of private companies to respond in theory to large social, economic, and environmental problems only from the economic point of view and uh, reducing a, a big humanity problem to just a few parameters and to uh, just uh, uh, enrich a few. 
And I would like to tell you that the virtual face-to-face -face format has to do because of the pandemic, COVID pandemic, and it is also an inequality in the sense that we can be here, but many colleagues from the Global South cannot be here because there's no vaccines over there, and that's why they're not uh, they're not here among us. So we should be critical as well about how we relate uh, ourselves internationally. I'm going to introduce to you the speakers. We have Faisa Mayer, a member of the African uh, Water Commons Collective in South Africa, Cape Town. It is a citizen's organization that uh, uh, struggles against privatization and the imposition of some methods uh, such as the prepayment meters and uh, uh, provisioning uh, cuts as well. We also have to the youth member of the Public Services uh, International in Africa. More than 20 million workers gathered in this organization, represented by 700 trade unions from 163 countries promoting quality public services. We have Leonard Changwati, member of the Water Citizens Network. This is a network from Ghana and uh, Eastern in Africa to develop the public uh, water uh, service. Uh, it is a human right and it should have a universal access. Marcela Olivera, member of Red Vida Group Planet Project in Bolivia, Cochabamba, and Blue Planet Project is a global uh, project uh, that promotes the value of water as a common good and it's part of Red Vida uh, from the Americas um, with more than 50 members of 16 countries. And right next to me, we have Bernard Mounier, the president of the Coordination Eau Bien Commun, PACA. It is an organization of Paris, of the PACA region, Provence, Alp, and Côte d'Azur region. And they gather citizens and different organizations that work on water issues, taking into account the social, environmental, health, economic, cultural and legislation dimension. They want to strengthen the movement of water as a common good, a human right. Uh, it should be a main agent in the decisions uh, regarding water in this region. We will have two rounds. Uh, I will ask some questions. The speakers will ask it. The first question is for Leonard. I would like to ask, what do they? What does it mean for them the celebration of this ninth uh, official forum in Africa, and what impact might it have in the African context? Leonard, you have the floor. Hello. Good afternoon to all. Uh, my name is Leonard, as introduced earlier. Uh, I'm based in Ghana. Uh, I work for the Integrated Social Development Center and also coordinator of the Water Citizens Network. Uh, currently also the uh, coordinator for the Alternative Water Forum uh, for the Africa region. Uh, many thanks, Dante, uh, to your question, the significance of the uh, World Water Forum uh, for us here in Africa. And I, I, my answer to that is that it portends heal. I mean, uh, because uh, from experience and from what we know, this is going to accelerate uh, the process uh, of privatization on the continent. Uh, because, I mean, there's been massive failure with the attempts to privatize water uh, around the world. Uh, in Europe, uh, you've heard, I mean, if you look at uh, some of the reports of uh, the Transnational Institute, you are looking at record numbers of re -unipolization. So that is communities taking control of the uh, water. Uh, 
So, 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 you, so you, we are dealing with a situation uh, uh, where you have a huge failure uh, that is with the, with the attempts at water privatization. Uh, so this this meeting, the ninth uh, water forum here in Africa, basically is about how they are regrouping. Uh, that is the World Bank and the uh, uh, multinational co-conspirators. Uh, this is about regrouping, re-strategizing uh, to see how they go forward. And it is interesting that they are organizing uh, this forum in to, uh, in Senegal. And that is not by accident. Uh, indeed, Senegal has been, has been um, showcased as one of the best examples for private uh, sector public participation. Uh, so, and I think they, 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 they had a lease contract uh, that is uh, Senegal lease water. Uh, they, they had a lease, a lease, a lease contract which uh, company uh, in France, which is which is uh, basically uh, in charge of, of of water in that country, and that same company, uh, the SDE as they call it, is also promoting uh, privatization of of water or commercialization of water in other countries in Africa. Uh, the last one uh, we dealt with was in Congo, uh, so. Senegal was not chosen uh, by, by accident. Um, it's, it's in federance of, of holding Senegal up as, as the example and, 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 uh, and uh, showing it to other African countries. Uh, in terms of the, of the impact of if they, they are able to go on with this agenda, uh, there are two things that they want. Leonard, puedes poner tu cámara. Leonard, could you please switch on your camera because we cannot see you. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, so, so with regards to uh, the impact, I think that there is two things that they want. Uh, uh, they want a deregulation of the sector. That is, uh, government taking away uh, the uh, legal protections. Uh, safety protections to allow for uh, private uh, participation. Um, and so basically the impact is going to be on the urban poor. And we, 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 we have seen it in uh, countries where there were earlier attempts. Uh, so I, I think the reason why they are in Africa is because they are being pushed out elsewhere uh, for example, in Europe, like I cited, the remobilization, and then also the, the 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 opportunity that they could still have have a way in Africa, despite uh, uh, past failure. So uh, there's been huge failures here in Ghana, where they attempted uh, privatizing. They ended up with a management contract which uh, was short-lived. Uh, it operated for about uh, five years, and it was not continued. In Cameroon, uh, recently also they have been they have been pushed out. So Senegal is is the is is a country that has been on this route since 1996, and currently this uh, Senegalese Water uh, Corporation is also helping to advance, like I mentioned, uh, commercialization, privatization of water in 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 other countries. So. Uh, it's, it's all in a bid of re-strategizing and holding Senegal up uh, as, as, an, as an example. Um, my, the, the question is, are they going to learn uh, some of the lessons that we've had from COVID, that water is, is, not, uh, is, is central to life uh, and, and that it also has a public health function? And for that reason, uh, there, should, there, should, there shouldn't be any barrier on the way of, of, of people enjoying water. There shouldn't be financial barriers on the way of people. Are they going to learn these lessons uh, because of the importance of water to health and, and all that? And I think, I think uh, this is not going to happen. They are not going to learn any lesson because our history shows that 
any time we go into austerity periods like we are having with the effects of uh, COVID and the toll on government revenues and, and budgets, that's when they take opportunity to squeeze uh, African governments and African countries. So we believe, so I believe uh, even with the aftermath of COVID, this is when they're going to ramp up uh, pressures on, on, on African countries to uh, go the privatization route again. Um, we saw uh, in, in the first World Water Forum in, in Marrakesh in 1997 and then in the Netherlands, um, in 2000, the aftermath was the huge uh, 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 citizens resistance that we have in we had in Cochabamba, uh, 2000 in the year 2000 also on downwards, uh, huge resistance demonstrations on the street of Accra, uh, and and then also elsewhere in Africa, very active resistance uh, in, in in South Africa. Uh, after the, uh, the first and second uh, uh, world water forums, where they came up with the, uh, the, the water, the water, the world water vision, the fashion one known as the Africa water vision, which they rooted through the uh, Africa uh, Union. Uh, yeah, you would they rooted uh, through the Africa Union and. Uh, down to the uh, respective countries under the, the, the guise of promoting and advancing the human rights rights to water. Uh, but then that was not it. It was rather taking away uh, water from, from poor communities. So I think uh, it's significant that it's in Africa and it's also quite uh, significant that it's being held in, in Senegal. But then there's an opportunity uh, the opportunity is that any time a group like this, uh, citizens or people also uh, uh, go into the forum that uh, uh, has been created uh, and which will be participating in uh, this year, that is the Alternative Water Forum, uh, which is the, the People's uh, Forum. So there, there's an opportunity uh, for, for, for us, uh, people all over the world, to bound together to group and then also alt, uh, offer alternative uh, visions. And then also to be seen, to be actively challenging the role and mandates taken, uh, take, taken upon, uh, taken up by the World Water Council and this forum. Uh, they, they have no such mandate to be setting any uh, global rules for water, global agenda for water they found a space that they are utilizing. And we think that there is an opportunity to uh, challenge them in this space and to accentuate uh, people's power uh, and, and, and voice. So we, we, we're looking forward, we're looking forward to utilizing uh, this, this opportunity also by pointing out to them the reason why they are meeting, uh, what they want to do with the people's water and, uh, and, 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 and getting, getting a response from people and elected representatives and politicians across Africa and, uh, and, and, and the world in resisting uh, in, in the, the corporate takeover of water. Thank you. Gracias, Leonard. Thank you, Leonard, and thank you very much for explaining the positive part that encourages us quite a lot. And uh, now we will move uh, to the Senegal, where we have Fatou. And I would like to ask the same question to Fatou. Specifically, what are the fears for the country, for Senegal, uh, in vis-a-vis -vis the celebration of this uh, forum, official forum. And what does it mean for Dakar, which is like a port of the northern countries towards your region? I didn't tell you about this, but please try and be brief in your interventions, five to seven minutes, so we will have time for a second round. 
and then we will have time for the debate too. Thank you very much, Dante, and I'm going to speak in French. It's going to be more simple for me. As Leonard has already said, uh, the multinational companies see Senegal as uh, the entrance towards uh, a privatization of the public services of water in Africa. And in fact, uh, Senegal is uh, uh, well a place where there's several, uh, uh, well, where there's the presence of the world uh, bank. Uh, and they want to privatize water. Also in the cities, we had a hydraulic legislation in uh, 76, and then we have had uh, a heritage society that has uh, taken care of all of the investments from uh, 96 uh, uh, onwards, it was SD that uh, was in charge. Uh, 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 we, a uh, French society, and uh, no, uh, society of several uh, countries, was controlling water until the year 2000. And now we have sweats uh, since uh, uh, 2000. And I would just like to go back to this uh, point to say that just uh, before uh, Suez uh, coming here, we had in SDE, uh, which was a, a private society, we had nearly 96% uh, of the uh, staff that was from Senegal. It, it was just one person that was not uh, by uh, Senegalese. Everyone was, everything was managed by Senegalese because uh, the state had created Lassones, which is this uh, heritage society, and they were taking care of all of the investments, exploitations. Uh, but then we just thought, so what is privatization for? When? Uh, the, the government is taking care of the investment. The commercialization is uh, done by the people from Senegal. Why having this private society? But uh, in January 2000, uh, after a tough negotiation, uh, well, uh, there was a contract of Suez for 15 years for water management. And one year after uh, Siege, we had to organize the Alternative uh, World Water Forum. Is it a coincidence? I don't know, because the World Forum had to be held in 2021. But uh, because of COVID, this was postponed to 2022. In 2022, Senegal will be the country that will host the World Water Forum, uh, where we're, we're going to gather all of the big water vendors, uh, excuse me for the expression, and they're here to see how they can share Africa among themselves, of course, with uh, uh, financial support, such as the FMI and the World Bank. Uh, and uh, before Suez uh, came, uh, and now with Suez, in the capital, Dakar in the big neighborhood. We do not have a big amount of water and we don't have quality water. For example, right now I live on a first floor and I don't have water. And this is exactly what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen then in all the other countries. And unfortunately, in the context of Senegal, in the context of the alternative forum, we want to organize it, but there's many people who still don't know about it. Some people know about it, but some activists uh, 
are now grouping, uh, grouping uh, themselves against uh, Suez, uh, which, and I think that this is a good uh, uh, way of moving forward because Suez is not just for Senegal. Uh, Senegal is just uh, the entry door, the entrance. They want to get into the other countries. Other countries uh, were able to stop privatization because they uh, were realizing how much the population was suffering, such as in Cameroon. I hope that we will be able to uh, uh, stop the pressure of the uh, financing pressure so that we will continue managing water in the public sphere. In Senegal, our contract with Suez, unfortunately, is for the next 15 years. It's a quite a long contract. And uh, uh, what is happening right now, and these are our complaints, uh, well, we have privatization of the urban uh, cities and uh, urban areas, and now we're going towards the privatization of the rural areas that were managed by the rural communities themselves, and now the state is trying to privatize. There's Aquatech uh, from Canada, SDE uh, was uh, here before, and they were not able to buy uh, or manage the urban areas, but now they're going to uh, manage the rural areas. And the bad thing about this is that uh, uh, here they have increased the price of the cubic meter of water, and these people cannot pay for this water. And uh, uh, the few people who can manage and pay this water, they cannot access to water. So when uh, they were managing their water, it was okay. They could manage it and they had water. But now that it is privatized, it's very expensive and they don't have access to water. And uh, I say that this is just like an entry doors. They want to get into the rural areas in Senegal, and they want to export this model to other countries. Unfortunately, our country is a good student, and we have this partnership, public-private partnership. And uh, this is bad for our population. And it's also bad for the citizens in Africa at large because everything that ha is happening in Senegal will be replicated uh, in other places, whether it works or not, but it will be replicated in other countries of Western and Eastern Africa, and unfortunately nearly all over Africa. I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. And by the way, I'm Fatou Dus. I forgot uh, my presentation. I'm a coordinator of uh, the movement here in Senegal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fatou. I think that you have explained very well the impact of privatization over there and that fear of it becoming the back door for the entry of these companies. You have explained the consequences, less access and higher rates. Unfortunately, this is something that we're experiencing here as well, particularly with Suez and other actors, because now Veolia has taken part of Suez, and we see we have to see how the private market, the water private market, is set up. But this may end up with a monopoly of water. Thank you very much for sharing this with us. Now <coughs> we are going to South Africa with Faiza because they suffer there the privatization of the large corporations, but also a bad public management or a deep trading management of the government. And in a, an extreme situation of drought that started in 2015, they started implementing a set of measures, very 
strict measures such as prepaid meters, instruments that have to be paid and regulated the quantity of water that each family could have. And the most vulnerable population were the most affected and they have well, even referred to mass destruction arms. And I would like you to explain, Faisa, how the situation is evolving and how are you working for the meters, prepaid meters? Thank you. Um, and I believe it's afternoon. Good afternoon to everyone there. My name is Faiza and I'm with the African Water Commons Collective. I am based in Cape Town. Um, I'm a backyarder and I'm a water justice activist. I'm also a member of the Western Cape Water Caucus and many other water justice organizations. Um, so maybe just to start off by saying that the water crisis that we had um, wasn't really a crisis. It was, and oh, it was not a crisis of a lack of water. Yes, there, there was a drought, um, but there was definitely enough water to cover everyone's basic needs. However, due to the mismanagement and corruption, um, the city of Cape Town, our government used the opportunity, that drought as a scare tactic to bully people, especially poor people into saving and paying for water that they already don't, yeah, they already don't have. While big businesses like your SA breweries and Nestle, et cetera, all of these companies that use lots of water, continued business as usual. Um, and the rich could install balls that is still not metered to date, um, something that the poor could definitely not afford. This so-called crisis in our view was a tactic to push the implementation of neoliberal policies through restrictors and collecting revenue by installing prepaid meters and water management devices, also known as weapons of mass destruction. Um, these prepaid water meters only provide a certain amount of water per household and it quickly um, devastated our community. Pre-day zero, people were living in these conditions for all their lives, especially those who live in informal settlements have been standing in queues, um, in long queues um, for hours to access only limited water, which means they've been facing this crisis or so-called crisis all their lives. But let's talk about why this blue top water management devices earn the name weapons of mass destruction. For, for number one, it was installed with no consultation, lots of lies and empty promises. People were told that they will be able to manage the water and those were only the ones who were con consulted. Others meters were installed without their permission, 10 year old sign on behalf of their parents and people go out and come home and just see this device here in the backyard, uh, outside of their backyard installed without their permission whatsoever. So people were told that they will be able to manage the water better. They were told that their rears will be scraped. Um, they were told that they would get 350 liters for free of water for free. And they were told, um, they were told that um, if they accept the water management device, some people were told that they will get their title deeds. So it would be a, a condition of owning your house. Um, mostly this opportunity was given to pensioners who had been living in their homes for over 30 years. And they were now told that if you want to own your house, you have to accept the water management device. They've also connected this device to our indigenous grant. So the city has a, or government has a grant called the indigenous grant that people qualify for if you earn below a certain amount or if you're unemployed, as an example, if you're a pensioner, you automatically qualify for this uh, grant. But the, but the city of Cape Town has now connected this, div this device to that grant. And if you don't accept the grant, uh, you, if you don't accept the device, you don't qualify for the grant. So definitely people could not save water because it's not enough, but definitely not enough water uh, because we live in overcrowded conditions in our communities on the Cape Flats. We have an average of 10 people living on a property and up. 
Um, there's extended family living inside the household up to four generations. We have um, backyarders, people putting shacks up in other people's yards. Um, these backyard shacks, shacks go up to four or five on, on one property. And so 350 liters of water was no way enough for people to manage the water like the city told them they would be able to do. Um, these devices were faulty. They still are leaving households without water for days or even months while the leaks accumulate depth because all the leaks are put onto our bills. Even if the city takes a week to come out to fill, to fix the leak or to fix the faulty device, the water that, that runs away, we get charged for that. Also, when this device was installed, people were charged 4,000 Rand, even though they didn't want the device. Um, the city has been using this devices, uh, the implementation of these devices to divide and rule us, the oldest tactic in the book. Um, there's division amongst and within communities. There's backyarders versus landlords, because as soon as the device was installed, the backyarders was the first to be cut off. It's RDP social housing versus informal settlement, because these RDP houses or social housing gets built with the, uh, with the water management device in. People don't have a choice. Um, they start off with the 350 liters of water, and they also have a bill for the water that was used to build their homes. So they have huge bills on top of the bill for the device that they did not ask for. These uh, social housing communities are now um, in such deep trouble that they end up standing in queues in the informal settlements, causing conflict amongst informal settlements and these low cost housing communities. People are fighting for water because the informal settlements are saying that the queues are longer and they are also complaining about low pressure. Um, they're saying that there's not enough water coming out of the tap. A uh, specific time of the day, the pressure runs slow. Um, the water runs slow out of the tap. And especially on a Saturday or weekend, the water stops um, and the tap runs dry completely. This causes conflict and the there's fights amongst the different communities. Cape Town, I think we must remember, is number five on the list of the most unequal cities in the world, with Johannesburg right there on the top as number one. This to us means that the gap between the rich and the poor is huge and continues to grow by the day. We have a housing, a housing crisis here, a backlog of up to, up to 450,000 families, Informal settlements have more than doubled post-apartheid. So 27 years into democracy, um, 27 years into democracy, uh, we have more informal settlements, our population have grown, um, and half of more than half of the population is unemployed. At least 50 new settlements popped up during and be, in the beginning and during the pandemic. Um, these communities have not been provided with services because they are considered illegal occupiers, even though our government was making announcements that everyone must have water. Many of our community members are still today without water. They've been without water before COVID and were not considered as human beings when the pandemic was at, as, as it, at its hardest, hardest. And those people had to rely on neighbors and broken pipes so that they can can get can access water um, pensioners scraping out ice out of their freezers so that they can drink chronic medication because they don't have water in the taps mothers making critical decisions of whether their children must wash their hands or whether they must cook food whether they can wash their washing or whether they can clean the house um, our communities are turning wor into worse than slums um, with these devices that are being installed. We are now at a critical period. It's local elections. Um, it's a time where our communities are being pulled from one direction into the other one. Um, the political parties are mobilizing and recruiting with T-shirts and, and food parcels. But we know when the elections is done, we won't see them again. 
And so our people are being pulled in directions and they don't know, and there's a struggle for us to unite. Um, uh, people also don't have no idea what's coming since the city of Cape Town has come up with a new way of, um, of getting money from the poor. Um, on the 18th of April, the city of Cape Town um, put out a new statement a media statement that said that these blue top water management devices has now come to the end of its lifespan. Now, no one told us, first of all, that it had a lifespan. Um, and secondly, this device has caused so much destruction in our communities. We are still suffering from the impacts, impacts of these devices, yet we are now just expected to accept that it's come to, an, to the end of its lifespan and move on when we know the impact it had and is still having. Since um, a few months ago, when the city um, put out the statement, they've slowly started implementing the new um, management, the new device, um, which they call a conventional metering system. They've slowly started um, uh, phasing that in, but most people don't really know what's happening or what's coming. The statement, um, says that we're moving now from 350 and the city is giving us 500 liters per day but there's a trick to it so a lot of people don't know what's happening they have no idea what's coming that it sounds very good you know and and, and we always say if it sounds too good to be true it is because they're telling us that they're giving us 500 liters instead of 350 but at the same time they're also saying that we must manage our own water so we will have free flow but we must stay beyond, below 500 liters for the day. If we use more than 500 liters per day for two months, then we will get a warning letter. Some of us have already received this warning letters. This letters is to warn us that we need to stay below 500 liters or we will be punished. If we go above the, the 500 liters, um, we will be put on a drip system and only allowed 200 liters per household um, per day, and it will only drip out of the tap. This is for us a disaster in the making. Um, we're waiting for panic to kick in as most people don't really know what the new conventional metering system means for us. And so it's important for us to be part of the space and we're organizing vigorously in our communities to conscientize our comrades, our communities to raise awareness so that we can push back and resist these neoliberal meters that are killing our communities slowly. Thank you. Thank you, Faisa. We are talking about measures that should be illegal because there's no consultation and because they violate the human right to water and sanitation and also because this also involves terrible consequences for public health because there is a restriction of water and you have to decide between using it to wash your hands, cooking or cleaning the house. Also, thank you for sharing this situation because very often we hear that this is a solution to a terrible drought, but we see that this is the result of a terrible management by the governments of the region. We are a bit tight for time, so I will ask the next speakers to be brief, please. The next speaker is Marcela. And after what we've heard from our comrades, it's important to have a sol an international solidarity and an alternative organization. But I would like to ask Marcela how her organization, how the organization of the alternative World Water Forum started since the first one in 2003. Good afternoon and good morning to one and all. 
I would like to send you my greetings from Cochabamba, Bolivia. We are very happy to share with you our perspective, how we have uh, seen and experienced this alternative water fora. And I'd like to share with you an, an anecdote. Maybe this will help us understand why these alternative fora are so important. I remember back in 2003 when the Water World Forum took place in Kyoto. Our colleagues in Canada and our colleagues from the uh, Polaris Institute with Bob Marlowe and Tony Clark, they asked the water coordinator in Cochabamba in Bolivia, and that was very strong because of what had happened in the year 2000. They asked us to create a small Latin American delegation so we could be present in the Kyoto official forum. We accepted. We said that we could organize a Latin American delegation. But the moment we sat down to see who could go, which organizations could be present, we realized that we didn't know anybody in Latin America fighting for water. So one of our colleagues in Canada sent us the uh, contacts of our colleagues of FETAPE in Peru or CDC in Salvador. And with that information, with those contacts, we created a small delegation and together with other colleagues in Kyoto, we managed to make quite a lot of noise in the official forum. And that's where we see as Oscar was telling us from Bolivia or our colleague Anaela from Salvador or Luis Cizarro from the FETAP, they were on a train coming back from the official forum and they were still there in Japan and they said it's impossible not to have a good communication among the partners in the continent and on the continent and how and, and, and it was impossible that, that wasn't appropriate so we decided to have a meeting of organizations fighting for water in the region in the continent with the goal of having a common goal against privatization. And the following year, in 2004, we organized this meeting with the support with the support from our colleagues in the north, and we were able to create what we call the Ibero-American Intervigilance Network for Water, and many years have elapsed since then, but it has consolidated as a benchmark in the region. And I'm telling you this because although we have these official spaces that are there and that have a strong influence on the policies of our country, we are also there and we have the capacity and the creativity of being able to generate other spaces that are our own spaces where we can share what we're doing. We can share our struggles. We can share our experiences, our victories, our successes, and cry together when we fail. And that's why it's so important to have this sort of spaces. And what's official is official, and it's there. And we have to try and shake up the policies that come from those official places so they are not implemented. But what's really important is what we do based on our own experiences with our own meetings, with our own events. And in this short presentation, I just wanted to convey the message that it, the time has come for us to summon ourselves. We don't need
need to be summoned by the great international organizations. It's the time to get together because we think it's necessary to to, to be able to keep moving forward based on our experiences. I think that I haven't answered your question, Dante. However, I think it's important to be able to share this anecdote that after more than 10 years has meant so much to us because we are in this movement that has consolidated itself and has become a benchmark in the region. So this is the message I wanted to convey, the importance of having these alternative meetings and events. Thank you, Marcella. Thank you for being so brief as well, so we have more time for that discussion. And then after talking to the speakers on the screen, I can now look at Bernard, and I'd like him to tell us about the successes of his organization. We know that in France, we have the two large corporations, Veolia and Swiss. Well, to talk about successes, we have to go back to 2012, to Marseille, and the Alternative World Water Forum. When we started preparing it, we were facing the big water corporations, and they had said all over the country and the world that they had solutions, but 10 years later, those solutions haven't really become true. They had the support of the French government and a set of international entities that are part of the World Water Council. And here, there were some NGOs and associations that live of the subsidies from the government. So they're also part of the game of the multinational companies. So we are still waiting for the solutions. And we were able to gather over 1,000 people in Marseille. There was a huge demonstration. If you know Marseille, it was a large amount of people in the central part of the city. We addressed many topics and we were able to know firsthand some of the struggles and we would have liked there to maintain closer relationships more regular relationships with all the people we met because it was extraordinary. There were many people there. However, after that, there was a network on the internet. There were some networks, water networks in France. And some were in English. But we really didn't move forward in a significant way in these relationships because they have to be mainly horizontal relationships. This is what was discussed, in fact, mentioned here before. So six months from that official forum of the multinational companies, the World Bank, the development banks of each country, the ECB. The truth is that now uh, we are short for time. We've looked at the European situation, but this is not enough. We need more relationships. They are currently scarce. This is what Marcela was saying. And this 
shouldn't come with this um, hand from the north like the Canadians that Marcella mentioned. In Europe, we have to favor the struggles in the south and that type of experiences in continental spaces or subcontinental spaces. And I believe that that based on what we did in Marseille, that was the starting point <laughs> to start thinking about the future of water. And maybe the future of water won't be extraordinary, particularly if we think of Dakar. But let's think about the future, because everywhere, if we think about the climate change and what has been mentioned at all the COPs, where they speak about mitigation of climate change. Now the multinational companies are thinking, well, we are going to use all these funds, all these credits, so that they can have a lever effect to promote partnerships, private-public partnerships, and the public is the financing lever, and the private uh, party does the management and obtains a profit. And it's within this framework of neoliberalism. It's from here that we have to think about the World Forum, knowing that the World Water Council is uh, losing its strength and they've decided to organize the forum in 2021 in Dakar and the next one will be in Italy, just next to the Vatican. So they're having trouble to find places to organize their forum because there are other institutions that exist. I'm thinking about institutions in Stockholm or the or Southeast Asia, and these fora will compete among each other. And we have the will of uh, we have the will of fighting against privatization, and we see that there are different uh, confrontations, and that's all. Thank you, Dante. Thank you, Bernard. Uh, so I remember well what you said, solidarity networks beyond the forum, beyond the res an answer or response to what multinationals are doing and underlining the value of everything in that we do. In uh, World uh, Council, that was not as strong and in the year 2000, we need to make the most of these weaknesses to strengthen our public, public community alliances with democratic values that put at the center democracy, uh, the people and the general interest. Well, as for six onwards, it would be good to have an exchange with the people that are following online and also the people here. So for the second round, let's try and answer in just two minutes, because I think that with your interventions, you've already talked about the community and citizens' resistance. My question is, what are the bases or grassroots resistance that we have in front of of these privatizing practices against uh, the population and the general interest, and that uh, affect uh, the most vulnerable populations, such as women, kids, and elderly. And also, what alternatives or how can we create together? Because here we have the European water movement. We're connected here. How can we continue uh, creating these strong, sound solidarity alliances that can continue uh, or uh, 
what are the possible international spheres uh, that are to come. So, Bernard, we'll start with you. Well, there are some uh, agents uh, that already tried in 2021 to organize a kind of forum, a forum open to everybody, uh, uh, polycentric, uh, worldwide. And they try to do this not face to face, but uh, uh, via Zoom and other tools. And uh, this is the only thing that we uh, could do. Uh, but uh, we need to know that organizing a forum costs lots of money, lots of uh, preparation. If we want people to move around, and right now it's difficult to move around, with less money, this is the best option. So we should have to implement this kind of forum, permanent forums uh, that would enable to uh, have the strugglers uh, gather together. People who are interested in this topic, they could gather together to deepen into topics and to deepen on the why. So why this kind of uh, struggle, why success, why failures, and others could make the most of these uh, lessons. I think that uh, in the present condition, this is what's more balanced to me. Thank you, Bernard. Marcella. Yes, I would like to talk about the alternatives that we are creating, not necessarily within uh, the framework of alternative forums, but uh, these spaces, as I was telling you before, are areas where we share all of these that we're creating in our uh, regions. We had the war water in Cochabamba in the year 2000, and uh, we've learned all of this because many times we fall. So it's a kind of trial error kind of thing and to see what works and what doesn't with us. But here in Cochabamba in the year 2000, and this was a big lesson to us in the water war, but was the fact that we need to start thinking about alternatives. We need to stop, uh, start thinking that we can win some struggles. When we uh, got the water company in Cochabamba, we never thought we were going to win. We never thought that this was going to be possible. And uh, when we had to present an alternative to the privatization and the bad functioning of the public company, we didn't have that alternative. And we failed. We failed in the development of this public alternative after the municipalization of water. So this was a very painful and harsh uh, lesson from the year 2000, and this made us think all here in Cochabamba and in the region. And we've realized about the importance of resisting, of opposing, of saying, no, we don't want things done like this. And uh, these are the, the guidelines that come from the official forums that we don't want. But at the same time, it's also very important to have an alternative. And this is what we want. This is what we want, and we're going to do it like this. So again, we need to move from the resistance and saying no to saying yes and developing alternatives. And I believe that we are moving along these lines in Latin America. And this gives me hope, because when I hear the colleagues from Colombia talking about their own legislation, legislation elaborated by them, you know, many lawyers gathered together, and they were the ones who uh, created it, working with the communities, listening to the communities, and uh, presenting some legislation alternatives that I believe are very important. So that's on the one hand in Colombia. And then regionally, and from Red Viva, we have created a platform. And when the World Bank started talking to us about the agreements, the 
public or private public agreements or the agreements based on uh, uh, commercialization and the benefits. We said no, we don't want this. We want our agreements based on solidarity, horizontality, uh, non-profit, and we're achieving it. Uh, it's very difficult because we don't have financing, but we do have lots of goodwill on behalf of workers, public companies, and organizations, and the communities that are well organized. So, although, and uh, you know, this is the kind of uh, Zapata approach, uh, although there's a big uh, lobbying, there's lots of positives, and in the region, we can create these alternatives. The blue communities, they are a great example of how we can move forward by celebrating our own victories, our own efficiency, our own way of measuring things from the organizations, seeing how good we are doing things without expecting or waiting for the acknowledgement of the entities that were criticizing so much. So again, uh, comrades, I think it's good to resist. I think it's good to say no to the official forum. But at the same time, I think it's important as organized communities to start thinking about alternatives and thinking about the possibility that we are going to win. And how can we replace this rotten thing with something that does work for us as a movement? Thank you, Marcella. Faeza. 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 Ivy. Ivy. Um, I think from, from my side, I would like to say that, you know, COVID as pre-COVID, before COVID, the struggle was on. People were struggling against all of these issues. And there was there was a there was momentum, if you like. People were already struggling and and suffering, and there, there was anger against this privatization that was happening with our water or the relationships that they are expecting us to build with these boxes, um, with these meter boxes. There's no more um, uh, people relationship where we can actually explain our situation and get support. We are expected to build relationship with these meter boxes. So when COVID-19 hit, um, I think organization um, generally went in to almost a lull in terms of the issues. Uh, and there was an urgent response from communities where food was concerned. Um, when, we were, when we were stuck at home right at the beginning, most people didn't have food. And of course, frontline activists like us, we had to um, take into consideration those people that we know of that had either the blue top water management device or had no water at all. And our job was to make sure that they had water. And in many different ways, we managed to supply them um, with water. So some of our community members didn't accept water, water management device because we were in time to warn them, to tell them about the impacts that this device will have. And those community members that did not at the time accept the device, including myself and my family, we were during COVID uh, the ones who could help the other residents who didn't have water. Um, we tried on so many occasions to get support from our ward councillors, um, our local government, but all falls on fell onto deaf ears to a point where um, it became our responsibility to ensure that our mothers and sisters um, and brothers who are unemployed and don't have access to water had water. Um, so since the levels had dropped and people were allowed to now be involved, because we must remember um, activists, a lot of frontline activists were marginalized and not able to participate during um, the pandemic. Uh, there was a lot of Zoom meetings and uh, most working class community people who, who um, I work with, people didn't have smartphones, they didn't have data, they didn't have electricity at their homes. Um, and for many other different reasons, they were left out of the conversation during the pandemic in terms of the issues or how to deal with it. 
And so since the levels have dropped and we are able to organize ourselves as the African Water Commons Collective, our key function is to provide education um, or political education um, and to support uh, the building of self-organization. And we do this through uh, the setting up of water action committees throughout the city of Cape Town and also in a, a rural, more farm rural area called Witzenberg and surrounding surrounding areas and so what we're doing uh, at the moment is as i said we're either in the process of setting up water action committees or strengthening water action committees that is already in existence um, these water action committees will for they focus specifically in the areas on the issues of water um, what are the impacts who's struggling why are they struggling and we try to support them um, yes individually but mostly as a collective, because we find that we are all in the same boat. We are all struggling around the same issues within our communities. Um, so we absolutely, I think, do think that this space um, is the, the Alternative Water Forum is important for us. It's a space where we can connect um, with the struggle internationally, because we understand that um, we cannot make change just locally. In my area where I live, in my backyard where I have a shack, um, the city of Cape Town will continue to ignore me unless I hold hands with the people in my street and we hold hands with the people in the broader community and then in the city of Cape Town and in South Africa and internationally. We will not be able to overthrow capitalism, which is ultimately what we need to do. Capitalism is in crisis and because of that crisis, we are suffering. There is no more ways for them to make money. And so they're finding ways for us to pay for their problems, for their faults. We are in situations where um, there's drought as an example, and then we are the ones that must pay. Um, and even in that drought situation, when our, we were told that we can only use 25 or 50 liters per day uh, because of this crisis that we were facing, that crisis has since passed, but we are still not using even 25 liters or 50 liters a day. People are using way less than that. I always make an example of a person, uh, a family in our community with 17 people, 10 adults and seven children. And these, this family has a water management device, a blue top water management device. And it only, because the thing is faulty, it only kicks out 76 liters for the day. And because it does that, the toilet only flushes once. Imagine 17 people going to the toilet for the entire day and during the night, and that toilet only flushes once. The children in that house has no idea what it means to open up a tap and drink water from that tap. They are always out by neighbors asking for water, etc. And so these are the conditions that we sit with. And that is why the African Water Commons Collective are very hard, very are very busy organizing our communities and making sure that we're forming these water action committees so that we can raise consciousness and raise awareness so that we can connect our struggles and so that we can critically push back um, these neoliberal policies that's being forced onto us, irrespective if it's going to kill us or not. Thank you. Thank you, Faiza, Fatou, Leonard, just the two of you missing. Two minutes, please be brief. Okay, thank you very much, Dante. I'll be very brief. I would like to talk about the alternatives. There's alternatives all, all over the world, but we need to find them. For those who are from the rural area in Senegal, uh, the alternative is what happened before. The rural community can manage their own water. It's uh, cheaper, they will have water, and uh, they will get benefits uh, that will enable them to have other economic activities. In the urban areas, it's what I was telling you about. The staff is there. We have competent local staff. We have uh, staff uh, that 
uh, was nearly 100% uh, from Senegal, and they did a good job. And even if uh, there were some lackings, uh, it was better. It's much better than what we have right now. And uh, the investment is done by the National Society. So why? Why do we need the privatization? What's the logic of this privatization? There's no logic about it. The alternative forum is the moment. It's the moment where we need to talk to people because the World Forum and the actors that are in the World Forum, they don't talk to people. They are not interested in people. They are interested in the governments, in the representatives of governments, those who are going going to be there who are going to say, you have to privatize water in your country. That's what they're interested in. Right now, in the Alternative Forum, we can talk to the population because it's the population who's suffering from the consequences of water privatization. Dante, you said this. It's uh, women and children. They lose so much time going to look for water. Faiza said that, you know, it's a family with kids who do not have access to water. And it happens everywhere, not just in South Africa. Whenever there is this privatization system, next to that, there's a real water lacking. Uh, we need to pay for this water, and we cannot pay for the water. So all of a sudden, we Women and children are affected by this because they are the ones who take care of these chores and they have to invest so much time and energy to go and fetch this water. So the alternative forum, this world alternative forum, this is the moment, this is the place that we have to make the most of, to talk to the population, to tell them that there's another possibility. And the alternative is the re-municipalization. We need to to uh, send out these private guys because they're not here uh, for our good will. They're not here with a good intention to give us water here in Senegal or Cameroon. No, they're here to get money. They're here for themselves. So we need to talk to the population. We need to tell them that there's a solution and the solution is not the privatization. It's going public. And uh, uh, in these uh, alternative forum from 2021. I don't know if you can hear me, but as for the alternative forum, can you hear me, by the way? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. I'm going to switch off my camera uh, to... Uh, have a better connection. So for the alternative next year, uh, in this alternative forum, we have an organization committee. And in this committee, we have already recruited a local coordinator. And he will be in charge of gathering all of the grassroots organizations who are willing to uh, get in touch uh, with us in Senegal. And we also have an African coordinator Coordinator, and we will talk about it. He's Leonard, and he's going to talk about it as well. And he's going to be in charge of coordinating all of the different regional activities in Africa. Obviously, we're always open to all of the organizations who want to be with us, because this is not just a, a struggle from Africa or Senegal. It's a worldwide uh, uh, struggle because it happens in Latin America and also in Europe and everywhere. Uh, people need to know that public services should not go private. Uh, they should remain public in uh, public management so that they are well managed. And basically, this is what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you for to Leonard. Hello. Uh, thank you, Dante. Um, we can't hear you well, Leonard. Maybe put off your thanks camera. Thanks to 
my felt the population that hello yeah let's try okay okay uh, many thanks dante many thanks to my co-panelists uh for pointing out the population we lose your connection Leonard. the cause for the phil private uh, the world water council and yeah hello hello can you hear me is it better yes sir. hello okay. yeah Oh, okay. 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 I was, I was thanking my co-panelists for pointing out the population that uh, suffers the most as a result of the fill uh, privatization agenda of the World Bank and the World Water Council and, and their uh, allies. And it is the uh, urban poor and rural poor that suffers the most. And within these two population, you have the uh, women and children who have to basically uh, use their heads to pot water into holes. I mean, that's the situation uh, across Africa. Uh, uh, in terms of alternatives being talked about, uh, bulk water, uh, the, most of the infra infrastructure is, is cent it was centralized, and the, the notion of community ownership and, and 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 what it implies did not go into 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 constructing uh, most of the uh, infrastructure that we currently have. So there's a concept of uh, bulk water metering where community redemarcate, uh, zone out, and uh, they they are able to get their own water and uh, take their decisions on how to manage and, and preserve their, 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 their system. Uh, for the rural areas also, there's been talk about the community water boards. Actually, uh, we've had a pilot in Ghana, uh, which was successful for about eight years until uh, it was thwarted by partisan uh, politics. But then there are some lessons that came out which uh, points to a different way of uh, organizing around water, which reflects the principles of uh, 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 democracy and then also having it uh, as, as public. So going forward, I think, uh, and then there is the public-public partnership, which is also facilitated by the global Water Partner, uh, Partnership Alliance, um, which is good because it brings, uh, it brings public institutions to help each other on the basis of solidarity and not profit. But then there's the blind side to it where you have public uh, uh, water uh, utilities, which are operated as uh, 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 PSPs uh, private, with private sector participation, and they are able to rope in some of these uh, uh, private sector uh, motivations. I think that's the what that's something that played out with the with in Senegal, and uh, they promoting uh, uh, Senegal water promoting uh, privatization in the in the Congo. Uh, so that's that's the that's that's an aspect of the. Uh, public-public partnership that needs to be fixed. Uh, but then going forward to the Alternative Water Forum, I think we should be able to uh, identify and celebrate some of these alternatives that are working well and doing well uh, in, in, in different countries. Uh, and then also beyond the, uh, the forum, we should be able to build a campaign infrastructure that is able to link experiences of the global uh, north with the south. And particularly, uh, I'm thinking about how we are able to influence the actions and ideas of uh, the aid institutions uh, from the uh, global, global north, uh, because they have a significant num uh, amount of power uh, in, in countries like ours. And I think democratically, uh, uh, citizens in Europe should be able to 
to, to, to influence how some of these aid institutions work and apply uh, uh, taxes of, of, of Europeans because some of them are, are pushing uh, for privatization actively, actively, actively here. Uh, so uh, I think uh, the, the, towards uh, the Alternative Water Forum, uh, which is, is our main focus, we are also monitoring what will be happening in the uh, in the in, in that for the corporate for the corporate world, I think the alternatives and what we do with alternatives after the forum is is what is is most important important now. Thanks very much. Thank you, Leonard, and thank you, everybody. We have 20 minutes to gather questions and reflections. Uh, there's a few online, but we'll start with those here. We'll gather three, we'll answer, and then we'll go online. Renato has a question. Anyone else? Daniel? Thank you very much for all of the interventions, dear comrades. I am Renato from the International Forum for the Water Movement and a member of the European Water Movement. As for the question I have in my mind, and I believe it's important, is what are the difficulties that you see in the construction of the Alternative Forum in Senegal? and? Do you think that this is a good measure, the fact that we have this international gathering in just uh, uh, organizing it in just a few time in Dakar with all of the international networks that can help you organize this international forum? Would you agree to get our help and uh, the social sectors uh, of Senegal, are they also involved? Thank you. I'm Danielle from the coordination au Ile de France. And I think it is uh, very important when we talk about water and the cycle of water, it's very important to talk about agriculture. We need to mention agriculture because water and the rain water it's to nourish the vegetation, and we can also use it uh, to preserve it. It gets it to the soil, and sometimes it is lost because the soil has uh, bad agricultural practices, and thus uh, the soil gets uh, very hard, uh, and then the water, there's no phreatic water. The rainwater cannot be in the soil. And then we go towards the certificate, the, 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 the droughts and uh, the certification. I think there's experiences, uh, and in Senegal, there's some pilot farms. Uh, I think that in Burkina, there's also the experience of Vevugri and a whole set of uh, farms that have uh, created uh, different systems that are fertile and that they resist this stress. So we can change the situation in the region. And if we restore the water cycle, we can totally change the situation in Africa too. And that's very important. And this is why there are some farmers that that are developing alternative solutions. And I believe that they are involved in the alternative forum. And it would be good if they were, because it's a way to prove that there is a future possibility in agriculture as well in Africa. If you'd like to 
answer Fatou, Faiza, Marcella, Leonard, or Bernard. Please feel free to answer. Okay, I think I'll take up the first question. Some of the challenges that we foresee uh, on the road to FAME 2022. Um, I think uh, it's critical that we are able to mobilize and also work with our elected officials uh, because we cannot do this alone. We should, we should be able to influence some of the uh, democratic institutions um, and I think uh, that is something that uh, we should be able to, to work on uh, between now and March. Uh, so uh, civil society uh, elected uh, uh, representatives of the people uh, putting in a word on, 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 on the alternatives. Um, uh, the past uh, experience with this uh, have not been, have not been easy, especially those that we have to contend with. But then that is something that is doable and we, 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 we're going to uh, make attempts, attempts at it, at least to draw them there, uh, have them make public statements uh, that, that, that shows uh, uh, the, 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 the direction in which we want to go uh, or that reflects uh, the, people's, the people's voice. Uh, thank you. So that's one challenge I'll, uh, I, I would want to speak about and something that we can overcome. Thank you. Dr. can I speak? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. The floor is yours. Yes. Hello? Thank you very much. I would like to say and explain that it is not now that we are starting to organize this alternative world water forum. We have been doing this for some time and we have organizations such as Blue Planet So we had problems with the sound, but the sound is back now. So as I was saying, we haven't started now to organize this alternative forum. We have been working on it for a long time with B PSE, Blue Planet, and other organizations. As I already mentioned before, we have hired a local coordinator that will be in charge of coordinating all the local actions to see which are the associations that are ready to help us in the organization of this alternative forum. And it's a pleasure for me to see the president of a young people's movement and they're very interested in the topic of water and we have been discussing these topics yesterday and today and these young people are ready to join us. So in Senegal, things are starting to move forward. There are some contacts, there are some actions. I wouldn't say that we are 100% ready to go. But I do think we are following the right path. And thank you for asking this question regarding local organizations. With regard to the solutions for agriculture, I'd like to mention something. In Senegal, we are one of the very few countries where some farmers, particularly in horticulture, use the private water of Swiss. They don't use rain water that's collected. And that's the way it is. 
because the population doesn't have enough water. I'm not saying that it's not important. I'm saying that agriculture is not important, but we could find other solutions such as collecting rainwater this year. For example, we had quite a large rainfall. We could collect this rainwater, store it, and use it. This is free water for agriculture. And this means having income for the farmers and income for the farmers and their products will cost less to the families. And something else, we could say that this is important for Dakar and for Senegal. However, drinking water cannot be used for agriculture. This is what we see in Myan that is above Dakar because drinking water is given to farmers. And I think that's another point we should discuss. We should be working with the farmers, with the government, to see how we can manage this topic as well. If there aren't any further questions, Thank you. Um, I think from from our side, we have been working with Blue Planet Project as well for since the beginning of um, when the discussion started around an alternative World Water Forum, but only this one. Um, it's the first time that our our organization is getting involved, and we've got a five month plan that can or plan that continues from now up until the alternative world order forum actually takes place. What we are doing is at the moment, even through our workshops that we're doing, um, we are raising awareness around the alternative world order forum and why it's important for us as communities to or, or organizations to, to get involved. And so we've got organizations on board, communities that we will be working with specifically around raising the awareness but also on uh, during the week um, when the alternative world water forum is happening uh, we would like or we want to have simultaneous uh, activities happening on the ground in cape town um, and Batsenberg, where we're working or wherever else we can influence communities um, to show solidarity or to show that they are aware and that they are involved and that we are tired of these big guns making decisions on behalf of people that they know nothing about. And so, um, yeah, I guess um, from our side, it's just working hard from year onwards and making sure that the, gro the ground is fertile um, when we want to bring our message across that we're ready and that those who are at that World Water Forum feel um, the impact that we have as a united front um, when we get there. Thank you. Thank you, Faiza. We have an online question. Martin will read it for us. Yes, there have been several questions. Some have already been answered through the Zoom chat, but there's one pending by Margaret Marion Stewart. Uh, it's a question for uh, to Faisa. Um, she said, well, thank you for your heartfelt presentation. Yeah, and the question is, uh, have you any access to legal representation to advocate on your, on your colleagues' behalf? Uh, I saw that question. Thank you so much for raising it again, and apologies for not responding to it. Um, at the moment, we are engaging <clears throat> uh, with organizations or institutions that do um, legal support. It's very, very hard to get pro bono work. Um, and most times when 
um, you know, we need legal support. It's often turned into a criminal thing. So when you when you fight for access to water, we get criminalized, and it's a criminal case, you know, more than a civil uh, or human rights situation. And so when we act individually, it becomes an individual issue and a criminal thing. But if we act collectively, um, you know, it's a, it's a bigger thing to take on. And so in our campaign, part of our campaign strategy, <clears throat> our campaign for Water for Life, in our campaign strategy is finding legal support for our cause, which is obviously, I mean, it can't be legal for, for people to be disadvantaged in these ways. And so we are in the process of speaking to these legal institutions to see, because we know we are fighting, you know, we, we, this is a big fight. We are, we are, we are stepping into, um, into dangerous waters, if you like. We are, we, do, we are going to need legal support at the end of the day, because um, from our local authorities, right up to government, to those who are making profit out of the water that they are selling to us, um, they, they don't take lightly, lightly to activists like us um, who push back and, and they call us the troublemakers. And so legal support is, is absolutely a necessity. And even within the African Water Commons Collective, we've got different committees. And one of the very important committees that we have is called um, the Self, um, uh, what is it, Graham? It's the Self Defense Committee. And the Self Defense Committee is looking into, into all of these things because we find our activists being threatened, um, you know, intimidated by police, traffic. Uh, cops who have, has nothing to do with water, following our activists around, our activists having to move spaces, their homes, because they're being threatened or they're being attacked. Um, uh, and so, yes, absolutely, um, not just for, um, we, don't, we don't just need legal support for the fight that we're taking on, you know, to, to, to show government that they are actually the criminals, not we, we're not the criminals, they are the criminals. But we also need um, the kind of to, to begin to look at the kind of legal support that assists and, and protects activists when they when they push the boundaries and, and, and it's seen as it's seen as criminal. Thank you. I hope that answers some of the question. Thank you, Faiza, for your powerful voice. I'm going to read uh, a commentary from Mira. She's from the Blue Planet Project, and she would like to make it as grand and as comprehensive as possible. But please, to all of you, keep in mind that we are a small group with limited resources. The way to add more depth and breadth to our work is by bringing more people power to this work, and of course, fi financial support as well. Bringing grassroots groups together takes money. Do get in touch if you think you can help with this. And come with your ideas, your research, we also have a research group working on the issues, but again, this is small with limited capacity. And to end, I would like to say that in the European Water Movement, we've decided to create a group to see how we can contribute to the international solidarity for the Alternative Forum, and you can be contacting us through the Blue Water Project. And I would like to thank, thank you all again. It's been a short discussion, but on the chat, we have some contacts that can be very useful for you. Thank you.